Hi, I'm Jim Juno, and this is the Juno Files. I'm the host, and if you like what you're seeing, please subscribe to us on YouTube, and you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Apple and Google and iTunes, uh, iHeartRadios and TuneIn app, so wherever you get your podcast. And I have with me today somebody who I really, really love talking to. This is a man who I used to watch when I was growing up all through the time when I was in college, every morning at 10.30 a.m., I believe it was 10.30 a.m. on NBC. It was called, the show was Hollywood Squares. I'm talking to the host of the Hollywood Squares, Peter Marshall. Hey, Jim, nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. It's so wonderful to have you here. Well, thank you. Let me ask, now, your book, it first came out in 2002, it was, it's called Backstage with the Original Hollywood Square. Right. A long time ago, I wrote that with Adrian Armstrong, who uh, was going to be here today, but uh, she had some stuff. She lives in Palm Desert, so it's, it's kind of hard to get up and get back and everything. But I, uh, no, we, um, they, I didn't just write the book. I mean, they came to me and they said, we'd like to do a, a thing on the Hollywood Squares. And so I, I called Adrian whose husband at the time, uh, and my he was my best friend. His name was Bill Armstrong. He produced Squares for many, many years. And, uh, and so I knew Adrian right from the get-go when we first started Hollywood Squares. And uh, I figured, she's a writer, and I, I figured, well, if anybody could write this book and knows more about the Hollywood Squares than I do, it's gotta be Adrian. And we worked about a year on it. and. Uh, it was a big, big hit. It was uh, Rutledge Hill, I believe, uh, originally uh, published it. I don't know if they're still in business, but anyway, uh, this was a big hit for them. <laughs> We're not the reason they're they're not publishing anymore. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was a big success, and I was very proud of the book. In fact, when I uh, Adrian said we're going to have this interview, I I had looked at the book in a long time, so I went through it, and it's terrific. <laughs> I must say. <laughs> A wonderful book. In fact, the reviews were like uh, the best book ever written about a game show, stuff like that. So uh, I was very proud of it, and I was I. It was really Adrian who who uh, just captured the whole theme of the book. Well, now it's being reissued uh, by Bear Manor Media, right? And and is there is there a new edition? I mean, is there a new new information in the book? I'm sorry. Do that again. Is there new information? Is there new information in the book? Anything added? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, there may be uh, could, because Adrian's handling it for me, and this has been a rough year for me. <laughs> I had the I, in January. I got the I got the virus, and then I got pneumonia. And then I got septus. Then I got the vi uh, pneumonia again. So it's been a, a long year for me. And then I had some tragic news. My son David, who uh, lived in Kauai, he passed. Uh, I'm so sorry. COVID. Uh, it's and I've lost so many friends. And you know, I'm 95 years old. I was 95 in March, and uh, uh, I've you know, I have a wonderful life. My kids are terrific. Uh, my grandkids and my great grandkids. But uh, the 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 one that's really got me through all of this is Lori, my wife, and. Uh, so I'm blessed about that, and I'm blessed I'm, that I'm doing much better. And um, but losing friends, not just the COVID, uh, ninety-five, you, you reflect, and you, I've lost so many of my really. In fact, I've lost I would say ninety-eight percent of all my old buddies, and it's it that is depressing to me. Uh, anyway, it's. But they're always oh. making new friends like me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, you got it. So and I, and I know we can't replace the old friends, but it's a wonder. It's wonderful that you're still here with us. I appreciate you, and I appreciate you doing this. Well, thank you. And you got the job. You got the job hosting Hollywood Squares. I got to ask this question. You didn't because you didn't want Dan Rowan to get it. I'm sorry. You got the job hosting Hollywood Squares because you didn't want Dan Rowan to get it. Well, how did I get the job? Yes. Go ahead. Well, uh... No, he said that. Um... He was talking about how you didn't want Dan Rowan to get No, I didn't want, I didn't, I was starring on Broadway with Julie Harris and mm -hmm. Charles Nelson Riley in a show called Skyscraper. Beautiful music by Jimmy Van Heusen and Sammy Kahn. 
and it ran a year or so. It wasn't a tremendous hit, but it was sure fun. And Julie was just the best. It was the only musical she ever did. And I got to know Charles. He became one of my closest friends. And um, anyway, I, I was dating a, a chorus girl, a dancer in the show. And um, the show ended and I came out and uh, they said, would you like to do a game show? And I said, not particularly, or no. And uh, they said, would you audition my agent? I said, sure, I'll audition. I was playing golf. So I came in, I had shorts on and a golf shirt. And there were nine people there, but with names on there, like Charlie Weaver, you know, uh, Rose Marie, Nanette Fabre. Uh, and they were the, <laughs> so they handed me the card. They explained the game to me, Art Lisi, who became, who was with the show to the end. I, what a wonderful man. Anyway, uh, I auditioned and, uh, and I left. And I went back to New York because I was going to do a show called, um, what the heck was the name of the show, darling? I was going to do a New York. Oh, Breakfast at Tiffany's? Uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, because A. Burroughs, the wonderful uh, director and writer, he said, I'd like you to do this show called Breakfast at Tiffany's. I said, oh, I'm aware of the show. So anyway, I get a call that, uh, this is in the book, by the way. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things in the book, how I got the job, uh, how, the, how, how, the, how the show ended, those kinds of things. And uh, so I, I, I said, they called me, I said, you've got the job. And I said, well, I, I don't think I want to do it. I, I want to do breakfast at Tiffany's. And uh, so I called A. Burroughs. And he said, well, we're not going to be ready for a while. So I called him back and I said, if I don't do it, who's going to do the show? And he said, Dan Rowan of Rowan and Martin. Uh, and uh, I mean, Rowan, <laughs> not funny, <laughs> Rowan and Martin. Uh, Dan Rowan, who had been an old friend of mine and Tommy Noonan. I used to do a comedy act. I've done a lot of stuff in my life. But I was did a comedy act for many, many years. Very, mm -hmm. very popular. We worked in New York a lot and Vegas. Anyway, uh, he said, well, Dan Rowan. Well, there are only two people in the whole wide world that I've really disliked. And that's Bert Convy and Dan Rowan because they did something that was unnecessary. As an example, Dan Rowan was selling cars uh, when, when we met him and Tommy, introduced him to, to Dick Martin and uh, and we wrote the act. We got him an agent. We got him the first job and Tommy had a blood clot in his brain and uh, he was at the motion picture home and Dick Martin was wonderful. He, he, do you need money? He would go out and see him. Dan Rowan, he was out there for almost nine months. Dan Rowan not once went to see him and uh, that really upset me so much. I was there practically every day, even though we were together at the time. Anyway, uh, and Bert Combi, that's in the book, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why I don't like, <laughs> I didn't like Bert Combi. Anyway, um, I said, no, I, I, I said, who's doing it? He said, Dan Rowan. I said, Dan Rowan? So the screw Dan Rowan, I did the show, 13 weeks, that's all it was. Well, after 13 weeks, we were against the Dick Van Dyke rerun, so we were in the cellar. And all of a sudden we started to climb. And after about 13 weeks, we were, we were doing wonderfully well. So they said, we're gonna do another 13 weeks. I said, I can't, I called A. Burroughs. I said, it's been picked up for another 13 weeks. He said, well, I was just gonna call you. They wanna go blonde. I, I said, what do you mean they want to go blonde? They want to go with Richard Chamberlain. Well, the show never came. Well, the show came in, but never opened. Breakfast at Tiffany. Yeah, yeah. It closed in previews. And I ran, what is it, 16 years or something? Mm -hmm. So you never know. You take a left, you take a right. Your whole life changes. And all this kind of stuff is in the book. And I talk about all my friends, Vinnie Price and, and Wally Cox. We were in the same PS 165 in New York together. I mean, I, the people that are on the show, I knew really well, 
before I ever did Hollywood Squares. Rose Marie, I've known all my life. Uh, Nanette Fabry, I didn't know well, but I knew I knew Nanette, and uh, it was it, it changed my life because before that I've never been out of work, but I couldn't sell four tickets. I, it was I, in London. It was Cheetah Rivera and Peter Marshall on Broadway. You know, blah blah blah, and and in Vegas, blah 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 blah, and after squares, I sold tickets, so it, right, right. it 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 made me an entity of sorts. I was known in the business, but it, the public really didn't know who the heck I was. And I'd been in the business what? I've been in the business eighty years, by the way. <laughs> I started when I was fifteen, so I was in the business like thirty some years, but as I said, couldn't sell a ticket. It changed my life. It really did financially and and uh, a lot of other ways. Yeah, it was fun to do. By the way, I only worked five hours a week. I would be working Vegas. I would fly in and uh, do five hours, do five, five shows in five hours. It was a half hour show, 15 minutes, change your clothes, another show. And then we had an hour and something break for lunch or dinner, whatever time we did the show. and. Uh, uh, so it was five hours a week, no rehearsal. I walked in, I just went over the questions. I knew everybody on the panel and <laughs> it was the easiest job I ever had. And uh, I miss doing it. I really do. It was, gosh, it was a lot of fun. I was going to ask you when you, I can, oh, I'm hearing feedback, but that's okay. I can go through it. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the, uh, the questions or the responses, whether, were they were they written out or was that just spur of the moment? Do that again for the responses. But, were they well, written? They were. Here's how it worked. They would they would not give them the question. They would say, "Pete's going to ask you a question on uh, uh, politics. If you don't know it, here's a good bluff." They would give them bluffs. They wouldn't give them the answer. They would give them bluffs. And with Paul in, people said. Did he write that stuff? Did they, did they write that stuff for him? I never knew the joke and he never knew the straight line, but I would pick up a card and I, I would pick up a card and it would say, you know, pull in and, and I would look at it and go, boy, this is a straight line. Mm -hmm. How many men on a hockey team? He said about half, you know, <laughs> that, I just knew, but he did not know the, the real answer. He had to do that, but, they wrote jokes for him and but it's it was the, it was the man himself he was just so clever and talented and uh, and funny and sad by the way this is all in the book i talk about paul and how sad he was in in his real life and yeah uh, i remember yeah. reading I that like to a lot of the people yeah uh one of my favorites on the show was charlie weaver Cliff Arquette, yes. Cliff Arquette, yes. And uh, one response I remember, or one question, is that you asked him, how many balls on a pool table or how many balls on a billiard table? And he said, depends on how many men, <laughs> how many guys are playing or something like that. <laughs> how many guys are playing? He was, I've known Cliff since I was 18. My brother-in-law at one time was the great singer, Dick Ames, and he had a, a, a radio show called The Auto Light Show. And I tell this story in the book, so I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to say what, but on radio he would dress up as Mrs. Wilson, his mother, and Cliff was just he was so devilish, you know. And uh, in those days, you had to do two shows. You had to do New York, and then three hours later, you did. So he would be in drag, and between the shows, <laughs> he used to drink. He would wander out of CBS and uh, try to pick up girls and boys, and they would call the cops. And he said, "That's Cliff." <laughs> he, he was just—he was a knockout. Yeah, he was a good friend. Wally Cox is another person who I used to always love to watch, and I was—I was really saddened when he when he passed away early. He was only forty-nine. Yes, I know. I mentioned Bill Armstrong, the producer. They were close. And Bill's the one that found him. Uh, oh, no. That he had died in his sleep. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He's, he's, uh, his ashes are mixed with, I believe, Marlon Brando's now. 
if I'm not Mar him and Marlon Brando's ashes are are mixed together now, I believe. Absolutely, that was his best friend. Isn't that funny, mm -hmm. Wally Cox? And in fact, Marlon wore his pajamas. You know how big Marlon is, yeah. and how tiny. Yeah, and for three days he wouldn't take them off, and he stayed at the house and he cried. And uh, oh yeah, they grew up together. In fact, oh. Wally wasn't in show business. Uh, it's in the book. Uh, Marlon got him into show business. And uh, I won't tell you the story because I buy the book. <laughs> exactly. <I know. laughs> buy the book. And you can, and I was going to say, we, we're going to, I want to talk a little bit about now. Uh, there were some running gags, running gags on the show. Um, Rosemary uh, never married or was guy troubles. It was. Oh, she married, but her husband died very young. And, mm. uh, and that was the love of her life. Uh, he was a trumpet player and that's in the book i talk about that mm -hmm. in fact uh, i don't know if you saw the motion picture she did right before she passed and uh oh her documentary uh, no it, it's it's her life story really yes. it's not a documentary it's it's uh well it's semi-documentary uh like a documentary but no it's her life you know she's she was a one of the biggest stars in America at the age of six, yes. baby Rosemary, she was a singer and uh, on radio and and she then she went to vaudeville and then she went to this and then and she worked in Vegas like I worked all my life. But um, she was really one of my closest friends. And uh, when she did the movie, it was wonderful. Uh, Wait for the laugh, it's called, by the way. Wait for the wait for the laugh, mm -hmm. and that is to Dick Van Dyke. She used to say, "Dick, wait for the laugh." And uh, anyway, she uh, knew more about show business, knew more people in the business than anybody I ever knew, and she remained a star most of her life. She these were all buddies of mine. Yes. I mean, the people I connected with long before the the show ever happened, and I'm so happy that uh, the show did happen. And that we all got to work together for so many many years uh you mentioned in the book there's a story about Ka about uh, karen valentine karen valentine karen valentine yeah um can you can you tell us a story about her well i didn't know karen uh she was doing a show called room 222 i believe mm -hmm. yeah and uh she came on the show and uh i don't know what this, i've there are many stories about her. I, I don't I, I don't recall the story in the book, but I'm sure there is. Mm -hmm. But uh, we just had her out here. She just came out to see us. Uh, everybody's gone, really. Uh, Abby Dalton died recently. And uh, well, but Karen, well, she was a kid when she did the show. So she's still a kid to me. <laughs> and uh, as I said, we were all very close. We we took trips together. You know, Hita Quigley, who produced the show, they would uh, put together travel. We'd go to Mexico and we'd go to up to Canada and all flying together. And uh, I, there's one wonderful story about Karen and uh, I think it's uh, Richard Burton that's in the book. Mm -hmm. so he was, we all had this private plane, except the only other one was Richard Burton. And he had, eyes for a little Karen Valentine mm -hmm. and it was part, well, I, it's in the book it's in it's the in the book, book. by the book and I, <laughs> I do like I do like the fact let's one you always in the book I'm going to mention one thing in the book you uh you taped the first three days of the week and then you broke for for dinner or lunch right we, and we drinks break, afternoon we break for lunch we did it at night we we had dinner, of course. All right, and then the Thursday and Friday, and people said the Thursday and Friday shows they wanted to come to the Thursday and Friday shows. The Thursday and Friday show, people drank. <laughs> yes, I drink. I don't drink, and I, I did maybe fifty some years ago. Mm -hmm. I'd have a Jack Daniels or something, but uh, I wouldn't dare. You know, there was just too much work to be done, and I don't even think I drank in those. I may have, uh, but I didn't drink. But a lot of people did. Paul Lynn was. You know, Thursday and Friday was watch out. You know, it was so much fun. And all I did was read the questions and laugh. I mean, it was so entertaining to me, this show. I, uh, 
I'm watching reruns every once in a while because I've been inside. I haven't been able to do anything. And um, I've been watching Match Game. Oh, I'm, okay, yeah. And, uh, and everybody on the panel is gone. It breaks my heart. But uh, Gene and I, I was a page boy at 15 at NBC in New York. And mm -hmm. Gene had been a page boy. And uh, I, I worked with his brother, Jim, Jim Robusso. Uh, and he, and Gene had gone over to WNEW and then had a hit radio show. He was a big radio guy at one time. Anyway, it, 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 I see all my old buddies and they're Charles Nelson Riley, who I did the Broadway show with. He's a regular on the show and he just makes me laugh so much. He was the sweetest man in the world and very talented. He was a great director. He directed opera, directed Julie mm -hmm. Harris, five plays. Yeah, he, interesting. I, I saw that, I saw the film he made right before he passed away. Oh, he did, uh, yeah. About his life. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, about the time when he went to the circus and the, it was the, it was the tragedy at, at um, uh, well, the, the Barnum and Bailey tent fire. Right. You know, he, he survived but some of his friends didn't but i remember but you know it seemed like a, um did you have did you have a favorite hollywood square did i have favorites did you have a favorite mm -hmm. yes i had a lot of favorites uh there's very few people i i didn't get warm with Zsa Zsa. i was never close to Zsa Zsa, but ava her sister i adored and we were good pals yeah it's um uh, it's funny. I'm trying to think of the name of the comic he just passed that was very disruptive on the show. And I only asked for two people not to return. Zsa Zsa was one. And uh, this guy, what the heck was his name? Do you recall, honey? Um, what, what? The comic that I... Oh, Jackie Mason? Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason. Oh, okay. Uh, he was a pain. And <laughs> um, if you, you know, we called your name, we went to you, you, you could do anything you want. But if I'm talking to Cliff Arquette or to Wally Cock and you interrupt, it's, it's very disruptive because mm -hmm. camera doesn't know where to go. Uh, we had a great director, Jerry Shaw, by the way, who, who's gone. But um, that, that set was really unique. I mean, was, was it? It was very unique. Yeah. Was it? A, I mean, did, did anybody almost back off the end of it? I mean, it looked like Linda it was... Ray almost fell. Uh, she was accident prone anyway. She was really hurt on the Sid Caesar show. Uh, almost killed her. And, uh, you know, she had the hearing problems. And uh, so she had to wear these really kind of... And then it got much better, you know. They, but uh, she almost fell backwards. She was up, up on top and almost fell backwards. Uh, I, I, I think Wally caught her. Really? Wally yeah, Wally grabbed her and caught her. Yeah. Wow. And there was an earthquake while y'all were while y'all were filming. Yeah, an earthquake. And, and um, Paul, Paul Lind. Lind. Yeah. He he leapt out and he was going. <laughs> actually, a cameraman dove off this thing and left, and we never saw him again. He quit. <laughs> it's in the it's in the book. <laughs> I don't get paid enough for this. Bye. <laughs> now. The, um, the what the prizes were all I didn't realize this the prizes were all um, in trade I mean for mentioning on the show that includes like the fur coats from Dicker and Dicker of Beverly Hills yeah I you know he was a good friend of mine and uh, he said that squares really doubled his his uh, sales. He said, "With us, he said it was amazing what Squares did for Dicker and Dicker of Beverly Hills." That was the that was the one thing I remember that whenever y'all gave away a fur coat, it was it was uh, from Dicker and Dicker of Beverly Hills. We did, and, you know. As I reflect, like today's game shows, you can win a potful, yeah. but I, I think if you won a game on my show, it was two hundred fifty dollars or something, and uh, if you won a couple of thousand bucks, it was a big deal. So, it was. I mean, and the Secret Square. Uh, did y'all ever? What was the biggest prize y'all ever gave away? I'm sorry. What was the biggest prize you ever gave away? I don't recall. Uh, the manager of the Boston Red Sox came back. I can't think of his name. Uh, 
but he came back. They won the they won the series that year. Um, uh, what the heck was his name? He, Dick Williams. He, he was our, he was our first big winner. He won like thirty some thousand dollars, which is unheard of yeah. in prizes and cash. Yeah. Was that Dick Williams? Is that could be? It could yeah. be. I, I think. I, it... I remember he was the manager of the Boston Red Sox. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One other question, y'all had uh, near after the show became successful, y'all did a, uh, some special shows uh, where everybody got to dress up. Oh, that was a an, a, an afternoon show. It was called. Uh, uh, it was for children. It was a children's show. What the heck was the name of that? Was it called uh, the Storybook Squares? I believe. Yeah, and everybody got into the outfits. I mean, Paul Lynn, uh, you know, he was just so funny. And they would give him all these wonderful costumes. The costumes were great. I said it should be, it should have been a, a 45 minute show or an hour show, a half hour. We did 20 minutes on costumes, just people walking in and on. And it was a kid's show. So it, um, it, it should have been an hour show or a 45 minute show. I've never heard of a 45 minute show. But uh, it was too, you couldn't do everything we, we, we wanted to do in a half hour. Introducing the, the stars and, you know, it, uh, I mean, Leslie Uggams was Snow White. I mean, mm -hmm. give me a break. <laughs> that, that's, that's early on. And, and she loved it. I did a show after Squares called Fantasy mm -hmm. with Leslie Uggams. Uh, we were on for a couple of years on NBC. And working with Leslie was, it was my idea. And I can remember, you didn't see many black people hosting or doing things in those days. And they had this young lady who was very good. And they had Mary Hart there too. And I said, no, I want Leslie Uggams. And, he, and the, the hierarchy said, she's black. I said, no kidding. I said, she's also talented <laughs> and she can sing and she's been a Broadway star. Oh gosh, and she did it. I said, I'm not gonna do the show unless it, Leslie's on the show. So we ran a couple of years and uh, we had so much fun. I wanna ask you, cause you mentioned it earlier, you had, you know, you caught COVID this year and you, you, got, you got through it. Thank, thank the good Lord above, you know. Um, how are you doing now? How are you feeling? Well, I have a balance problem. Walking has been a big balance, you know, and at 95, I, I should have a balance problem anyway. But uh, my Laurie and my, my, my kids, and they, they got me through it. I had wonderful doctors, but uh, if you can avoid a hospital, please do. Uh, it's better at home. It really is. Uh, call them in because uh, the hospital, I think they're, they're the other ones almost killed me. I almost passed, mm. but they brought me home to pass. <laughs> and then I had this wonderful care from uh, some terrific doctors, but especially my, my Lori. Well, I'm so glad you're here. I'm still, I'm so glad you're still here with us. And I call you Mr. Marshall because I have that much respect for you. Uh, but I would, I would love to be able to call you Peter, but um I appreciate you taking time tonight and doing the show. My pleasure. And the book is Backstage with the Original Hollywood Square. Great, you can Great pictures, by the way. Yeah. Nobody ever heard of. And you can find it. You can find a lot of information about it at bearmanormedia.com. Yeah. I, 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 Adrian sent me this uh, because Adrian's the one that's really behind this. She said uh, the original publisher was uh, Rutledge Press about 20 years ago. Uh, you'll be able to order through Bear Manor Media, that's B E A R, Manor Media, or on Amazon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, while Kindle uh, version is still available, I would wait for the hardcover. I really would, because it, it's something that I think you'll treasure. I'm very proud of the book and very proud of Adrian for knocking yourself out. Well, I tell you, what, I appreciate you doing this tonight, and I hope we can talk again real soon. So you take care. And again, it's been wonderful having you on the Juno Files. Thank you.